Hare Krishna. Grateful to be here with all of you today. And today we will discuss some commonly asked questions about destiny, free will and karma. So the first question that comes up is, is there something called destiny at all? To understand the answer to this question, let's first check what do we mean by the word destiny? <clears throat> Broadly speaking, whenever we function in our lives, there are some things in our control and some things not in our control. In fact, we can say that there's only a little few things in our control and many out of our control. So broadly speaking, the things which are out of control, our control, but which shape the results, those are what are often referred to as destiny. Thus, for example, if a cricket team is in a winning position, <clears throat> but suddenly the rains come and wipe out the match, then what happens is they can't win. So that was, they were, they're playing well, they could have won, but they couldn't because of destiny. So we could say at that time, destiny was against the winning team, the team which is about to win, and destiny worked in favor of the team which is about to lose. So now this term destiny has many different correlates across culture. There is kismet in the Arabic tradition. There is fate also in the broad uh, Western tradition. There is daiva in the Vedic tradition. So broadly speaking, it's implicit. It's, it's implicitly understood and it's universally observed also that the results of our actions don't depend on our actions alone. They depend on many factors beyond our actions. And they are called as destiny. So to repeat, destiny refers to the set of relevant factors that are not in our control, but that shape the results of what we want to achieve. So that there is something like destiny is understood in every area of life. We want to get to an important meeting on time. We start well in time, but there's a deadly traffic situation and we just become, can't move forward. Or we are driving to a destination and suddenly a storm comes and everything gets paralyzed. So right now, for example, in the world, travel and tourism and everything else is stopped by pandemic. So this is things beyond our control. So whatever is not in our control, that can be broadly referred to as destiny. So those things, now the word destiny may be used by different people in different senses. But this is what we are referring to, things which are not in our control, things which are given, things which are existing as they are. Now sometimes these can work favorably for us, sometimes these can work unfavorably for us. So two friends or two relatives, they have been separated for a long time. And then coincidentally, they meet. Uh, now, we may use the word coincidentally, but if you look at it in terms of mathematical probability, they were in different parts of the world, that they were not even looking for each other, and yet the two meet each other. How does that work out? That works out by destiny. So, destiny can work. Destiny means the uncontrollable things which shape the results of what we are trying to achieve, which shape our way of living. That's destiny. So now this raises to natural next question. Is everything destined? If yes, then what is the use of trying for anything? And if not, then how do we know what is destined and what is not destined? Well, first thing is, certainly we can say everything is not destined. If everything were destined, then we would have to ask the question, is you're asking this question destined? Is my answering this question destined? Do we at all function as if everything is destined? Now, if, if person A comes suddenly and slaps person B, and person, why did you slap me? Oh, it was destined. And person B will say, I'll slap you back now. And that is also destined. No. So, whenever we interact with each other, we presume a sense of certain sense of responsibility and accountability for our actions. And what does that imply? 
But there are things in our control. When, when we ask someone, why did you slap that person? The whole system of relationships is based on mutual accountability. The whole system of justice that we have is based on accountability and culpability. Who is that some people are responsible for their actions. And if they don't act responsibly, they will be punished. They will be disciplined appropriately. So we do have free will. We do have some scope for free will. So everything is not destined. So one way to understand this is that suppose we are driving by a car. Now, say our company, our company has provided us a car. And that car is not the fastest of cars, not the smoothest of cars. But it's a car that we have. And we are driving it now. And we are going through a particular road where there's a particular kind of traffic and there's a particular kind of weather. So the car we drive is fixed. The, the traffic and the weather conditions that we will drive through are not in our control. The car, car which we are being given to drive, that is not in our control also. But what is in our control is how we drive the car. What we do while we are driving the car. So, so that means in every situation, there are certain things which are not in our control and certain things which are in our control. So the things which are not in our control, we can say that they are destined. And the things in our control are not destined. So if you consider the Bhagavad Gita as the basis of, a, as a source for a sound understanding of destiny, then the Bhagavad Gita is itself containing many directions. Do this and don't do this. Mm -hmm. So if the Bhagavad Gita's teaching was everything is destined, if the reality is that everything is destined, then the Bhagavad Gita itself becomes meaningless because people do not have the free will, the agency to choose. Should I do this or should I do that? Then what is the point of telling people do this and don't do this? So no, everything is not destined. There are some things which are destined and some things which are not. Say for example, a person's face, the complexion on a person's complexion of a person, sorry, that may be destined in the sense that some people have fair complexion, some people have um, not so fair complexions, whatever it is. Now that is not something which is under their control. That is something which is destined. But the expression on a person's face, that is very much under their control. A person may look very good, but if they are constantly scowling and glaring, they won't look very attractive. A person, on the other hand, might not have a very attractive face cut. Their complexion might not be that great. But if they are cheerful, their eyes are eyes and smile and disposition are, is very pleasant and welcoming and cordial, then that itself will make them attractive. So we could say destiny determines the complexion of our face. We determine the expression on our face. So now in different situations, the jurisdiction of what is in our control and what is not in our control may change. And say, for example, if we are driving, going back to that metaphor, now there is one road to our destination, there's another road to our destination. Now, right now we come to know that this road is a little risky, but it is also a short, shorter road. We'll get there fast, get to our destination faster. It's a safer road, but it's also a longer road. Now, at this point, we have a greater choice uh, that should I go by this road or by this road? Now, once I choose a particular road, then my choice changes. That, okay, I'm on that road. Sometimes if you're on an expressway, you can't even take a turn. You can't suddenly go from change, change directions. You have to wait for an exit and then we have to change directions. So once one takes a choice, sometimes it may mean for the next three miles, there is no way to turn back. So in certain situations, our choices may be more. In certain situations, our choices may be less. But we always have some control. So how do we know what is in our control and what is not in our control? We have to use our intelligence. And we have to use our experience. Say we could say life is like a tennis match in some ways. During a tennis match, sometimes the player is serving. And sometimes the player is returning. Now, the player who is serving has far more control. Where to hit the ball, into the body, away from the body, on the forehand, on the backhand, at what height, at what speed. All that is in the control of the player who is serving. So we could say for them, 
the area of choice is much higher at that time but after some time that same player will be returning at that time that person's sphere of choice is much much smaller that time wherever the ball comes on the body away from the body at whatever height whatever speed whichever side of the hand my forehand or backhand you just have to get the racket there and get the ball back into play so now there are some players who are champion servers and they their main strength is their serving there are other players whose main service whose main strength is returning they're expert at returning so so that means even a situation where one has far less control even in that situation one can gain some expertise and that can also lead one to achieve significant things so the principle is that which is in our control is not destined and that which is not in our control is destined so and this can change from time to time that's why we have to observe the situation and understand that so now once we understand that there is free will a next question might come up so is this is free will for real and if yes it is everyone have equal amount of free will or does the amount of free will with people change with time and do different people have different kind amounts of free will yeah so to address this question i would like to introduce two or three concepts rather free will then there is will power and then there is freedom i repeat free will will power and freedom now what is the difference between these three things free will refers to our inner capacity to choose so, so the free will is something which is always there with us it is intrinsic to us as spiritual beings as conscious beings so let's try to understand this now to make it easier let's start with the outermost concept freedom freedom means our capacity say to move about freely to express our views to make our, um, to make our own decisions say suppose somebody is in a jail now their freedom at a physical level is significantly restricted so they cannot go out of the jail beyond the jail walls if they are been violent especially then they may be confined even to their own cell they may not even be able to go out of that so what does this mean that they their freedom is restricted but do they have free will yes they do there are many people within the jail they may associate with other criminals and they may become far more hardened and worse than criminals and others in the jail they may try to get into rehabilitation programs they may learn some uh, vocational skills they may even get some degrees by studying in the jail so what is happening over here within the restriction that they had of physical of physical restriction they still had some scope for free will so at the very least if such facilities are not there within the jail a person can choose to be sullen and uh, depressed and disagreeable or a person can be more accepting more resourceful and see how I, how one can be of help to others how one can make the best of the situation so that free will free will is there even when the freedom is lacking so freedom refers to the external facility external scope over which we exercise our free will <clears throat> so so, <clears throat> so freedom <clears throat> <okay>. <clears throat> may be absent and yet free will might be there similarly <clears throat> will power may be present or absent and still free will might be there now will power means if somebody resolves i am going to exercise every day i am going to regulate my diet i am going to meditate every day i am going to, a student might decide i am going to study every day so now they may decide that but are they able to do it maybe maybe not different people may have different degrees of success so they have free will even a person who is very spiritually apathetic may desire i want to meditate every day but they may not actually meditate why the difference because their will power may be deficient 
So willpower, we could say, just as freedom determines the scope over which our free will can be exercised at the physical level. So willpower refers to the scope over which our freedom is exercised at the psychological level, at the level of the mind. We intend to act in a particular way, but within our mind, our desires, our moods, our distractions come and they prevent us from acting that way. Just as, say, why does a person go into a jail? Assuming it's a fair, a fair trial has been done. It's a person who has done something criminal. They have done something wrong because of which their freedom has been curtailed. So similarly, if we, so, uh, if we do something wrong, then our willpower internally gets curtailed. If a person drinks alcohol repeatedly, they drink repeatedly and after a period of time when the temptation to drink comes, it's almost impossible for them to resist it. It's not intrinsically impossible for them, but circumstantially for them, when the temptation comes, it just can't say no to it. On the other hand, say if there are two people, I say this is their home, this is their office, both stay together, be nearby, and they're going to the office. On the way, there is a bar. A person who has never drunk, they just pass by, they didn't notice it. So for them, there is no willpower issue over there. For somebody who has drunk regularly, they see the bar, oh, let me go and drink, let me go and drink. No, I won't, I won't, I won't, I will, I won't. And finally, they might just go and drink. So what has happened is, for them, their willpower has become substantially weakened. So it's not that different people have different degrees of free will. Everybody has free will. But different people may have different degrees of willpower. And that's why different people may feel that, uh, some people may feel, I'm just helpless, I can't do anything about it. So addiction, we could say, is a situation where the willpower has been almost entirely sabotaged. Thankfully, it is never sabotaged. Within whatever scope we have, if we use our free will well, slowly but surely the scope can increase. Just as a person, might, a criminal might be put in a dark dungeon and within the dungeon also their foot is tied to some, uh, <clears throat> some pillar or some heavy stone or something like that. And they are fettered over there fettered and shackled. But if they behave well, gradually they might be removed from the dark dungeon. They might be put in a cell with other people. They might be given some freedom to move about within the jail premises. So similarly for us, whatever little area of control we have, if we use it positively, we can increase our free will. We can actually, sorry, we can increase our willpower. So, so the positive use of our free will increases our willpower. And the negative use of our free will decreases our willpower. So now, with this in mind, the next question that may come up is, that is it possible for us, whenever we are functioning in our lives, to change? Yes, of course it is possible. And that, is, that brings us to the concept of karma. So what exactly is karma? Now, the word karma can have multiple meanings. At one level, karma simply means action. That, okay, each of all of you should do our karma. You, what, what karma are you doing? Is it you're doing this, you're doing that, A, B, C. Karma can simply mean action. But karma can also sometimes mean reaction. Oh, I'm just suffering my karma. It's in my karma. What does it mean over there? It means that it is the reaction to our karma. We did something and we are getting some result in the return. So, and karma can also refer to the system of action-reaction. So nobody can escape the law of karma. Everybody is accountable for their actions. So when we are using the word law of karma, we are referring here to what? To action, to reaction and the correlation between them. So that is karma also. Now, beyond that, the Bhagavad Gita use, uses karma in one more sense. It refers us to karma as sukarma, a good kind of karma. Karma which is done as a sense of duty, as a sense for creating good credits for our future. So, broadly speaking, karma refers to action or its reaction or the system of action-reaction or a particular good kind of action. So, what does uh, 
And how does karma relate with destiny? Is there a relation? Yes, definitely. Basically, what we call as destiny is the fruit of our past karma. Here we'll see that <clears throat> karma is, if you consider this to be like a water tank over here. Now, in this water tank, we will see that the actions that we are doing, they are like the water going into the tank. Now, when the water goes into the tank, it's going in from one inlet and from our outlet, it is coming out from here. So now significantly, what happens is sometimes the water, inside this water tank, there are many pipelines. So there is one which is straight, there's one which is slightly twisted and one which is very convoluted. So sometimes what happens is our actions give immediate reactions. So if I put my hand in fire, immediately my hand burns. So that is an action leading to immediate reaction. But not all actions lead to immediate reactions. Sometimes, say, if somebody takes a dozen ice creams on a cold evening, now they may enjoy the taste of the ice cream at that time. But the next morning when they wake up, ice cream, ah, they, they, they'll not even be able to scream properly. They'll feel so much pain. Their throat may be sore, terribly sore. So what has happened over there? That what has happened is for them, that karma is delayed. The ice cream, the consequences of it came after six hours. So that's slightly delayed karma. Now, sometimes the karma might be get very, very delayed. Say somebody starts smoking at the age of 15. And then at the age of 45, the doctor tells them, you have got terminal lung cancer. In fact, karma, can, the delayed karma can come over multiple lifetimes also. That means... Some people may have done some bad things in their previous life. And in this life, they're trying to get their act together. They're trying to live properly, but still bad things happen to them in this life. So that is karma, which was, so it's like from here right now, they're putting in good water, but in the tank, still there is a lot of bad water and say, what is happening is the water coming out from here is from this pipeline. So it's not that the water coming in from here is going, coming out, coming out directly over here. The water that is going in, coming from here is, uh, is coming in from here is going into this long pipeline and the water is coming out from here. So therefore, what happens is for them, there is a lot of seeming injustice. I'm doing good and still bad things are happening to me. So it's not exactly bad things. It's rather our, our past karma whose reactions had not yet come to us are now coming to us. So here, the principle to understand is that there is this whole accumulated karma we all have, which we have not yet received the reactions for, but that water has already gone into the tank and that water is going to come out. So that accumulated karma is what is called as destiny. So when we do actions, they produce reactions. But not all reactions come immediately. Those reactions which are stored for us to, for, to be delivered to us in the future, they are what are called as destiny. So going back to an, the earlier example I gave of a person drive, being given a car to drive and driving through particular weather and uh, traffic conditions. So <clears throat> we consider that, say we are born, we are born with a particular body. It may be healthy or sickly. We may be born in a wealthy family or a poor family. We may be born in a um, society that is where the, which is politically relatively stable. And we, or we may be born in a society where politically there is chaos and pandemonium and violence and riots and bloodshed. So this is like the starting situation we find ourselves in. So we have a particular kind of body. We have a particular kind of starting kind of situation. So that is determined by destiny. That's like the car we have and the conditions from where we start driving. But that is not in our control. The car we get is not in our control. And the conditions through which we have to drive the car, that is also largely not in our control. But what is in our control is how we drive the car. How we drive the car. That is very much in our control. If we drive the car carefully, if we drive the car uh, maturely, then even through difficult conditions, we can move ahead 
and we may get to a safe destination. That means our karma and destiny related. That our destiny is formed by the accumulated results of our past karma that have not been delivered, and our present actions will determine our future results. So this could also be stated as a simple equation of four Ds. That when we do actions, our actions alone don't determine the results. There is karma plus daiva plus kala that leads to phala. There is our actions. There is the what we do. Then there is our destiny. Then there is duration. So whenever we do an action, the action doesn't immediately lead to results. It actually leads to results over a period of time. It takes time for the results to manifest. So consider over here uh, a farming metaphor. So if, it, if we're farming, what happens is so when we are farming at that time, the, <clears throat> the farmer has to plow the seed and sow the land. That is the plow, is plowing the sowing the seeds and plowing the land. That is karma. That is the duty the person has to do. Then after that, rains have to come at the proper time in the proper quantity. That's the work. And if that also happens, that doesn't mean they'll get the harvest immediately. After that, there is kala. Kala is that the season has to change till the harvesting season comes. And then they'll get the fuller. They'll get the desired result. That is the harvest. So that means one relationship between karma and daiva is also that uh, daiva and karma have to come together with kala, with time, so that the fala, the desired result can manifest. So all these four, when they come together, then we get the desired result. Another example could be, say a couple who desire to have a child. Now when they desire to have a child, they may try. They may try, but even when there is union, there may be no conception. And so, so a couple com coming together, that is, that is karma. That is the, that they are doing their part. What is in their control? But just because there is union doesn't mean there is conception. So that conception is daivo. Conception happens because of daivo. And even if conception happens, that doesn't mean that automatically there is going to they can have a child the next day. There is a period of gestation, and after gestation, then the child child is they get a child. So that's the desired result. So, karma, daiva, kala, all these three determine whether fertility, uh, whether a person will have a child or not. So, in this way, this is the, these are the broad patterns of relationship between karma and daiva. So, on the destiny, the same thing. Generally, we say, that means God has a better plan for us. That, uh, that, so, are the two the same thing? Well, not exactly. God at one level is transcendent. Transcendent means that he, he doesn't inter, he is not directly involved in the functioning of our of the world. So if you can consider, for example, that there's a law of gravity. So now if you consider the law of gravity, if a person steps off a 10-story building and they fall down. So now, can we say that God caused them to fall down? Not really. God didn't cause them to fall down. They, because they acted irresponsibly, they chose to step down from that place where they were at. And once they chose to step down from there, they're going to fall off. So destiny, so gravity, is it God's will? Well, not exactly. It is the mechanism that exists in nature. Now, we could say that mechanism exists under God's supervision. The Bhagavad Gita says, Maya adhyakshena prakriti suyate sa characharam. That everything works under my supervision. So, the system has been set up by God. But that doesn't mean that when specific people work in specific ways within that system, God is personally favoring someone and not favoring someone. If a person steps off from a 10-story building and falls down, it is not that God caused them to fall and uh, break their limbs or even break their head. No, that's not true. They did, they, they did that to themselves. 
So destiny in that sense is, if we consider earlier, that destiny is what? The sum total of our past karma. That is delivered to us at different times. So we all have done some karma from our past and that karma is going to come to us upon some, some time or the other. So whatever is that karma which is going to come to us in the future, that is called as destiny. And this whole system of action, reaction, coming together, that is, that is actually uh, under the supervision of God. So in that sense, God's will exists above destiny. So it's not the same thing. Let's try to understand this in another way. So destiny is what? It's the stockpile of the reactions to our past actions. Reactions that will come to us in our present and future. That is destiny. So destiny is not God's will. Rather, destiny operates under God's will. Destiny operates under God's will. So now that brings us to another point over here. Destiny operates under God's will. That's why we need a certain level of maturity, a certain level of detachment. Because by destiny, sometimes we may not get the results of our actions immediately. Uh, one, of the, one of the teachings of the Gita that is often misunderstood is, Krishna says, don't be attached to the fruits of your work. Now, why does Krishna say this? What is the logic? That we work to gain results. Otherwise, what would be the, what would be the motivation for us to work also? Yeah, that's true. We cannot actually work that way. That uh, we will have some aim. But the point is, karma plus daiva plus kala leads to fala. Karma plus daiva plus kala leads to fala, as I mentioned. So, what it means is that we have to do our karma, but sometimes the fala may not come because the remaining factors may not be in our control. And that's why don't be attached to results means don't get obsessed if the results don't come. If the results don't come, don't get infatuated with them. Don't get uh, intoxicated. Don't get inebriated. Don't get carried away. If you're more successful than you expected and don't get devastated if you're less successful than we expect. So that's what we have to consider over here at this stage. So destiny is working under God's will. But let's look at this to another example to illustrate this point here. How uh, the principle of karma is complicated to understand. And that's why detachment is helpful. Sometimes people ask this question. This question may come up that why can't we just get the results of our karma immediately and the whole issue becomes settled thereafter. Why have this whole complicated system where, wherein you know, the results come later? Doesn't it confuse things? Well, it's not that simple because sometimes certain actions require certain situations for their results to come. Let's look at this for example. Say, suppose somebody has a credit line in the supermarket. Now, when they have a credit line, it means they may buy something worth $50 once. And they don't have to pay anything at that time. They may again buy up to $20 something at one time. The arrangement by which they can pay only at the end of the month once. And it'll just be immediately debited from their bank account or they will get the bill at that time. So this person keeps buying and each time they're buying, they don't realize, okay, I just bought this much, I bought this much, 80, 100. And then one day they go to the supermarket and they buy for $5 and suddenly they get a bill for $255. Hey, what's this? How is this? Why did I get a bill for $250? I only bought worth $5. Well, yes, you bought worth $5, but the bill is not for what you bought just now. The bill is for what you bought throughout the month. So sometimes the billing system might be such that uh, you, we get the bill once, but then we get the bill for everything that we have done in the past, uh, in the past particular period. So, one, so similarly for us, sometimes in life, one effect may be the result of multiple causes. So we may make one mistake and it's a minor mistake. But then suddenly you know, we, we are working in our office and we get fired for that. Hey, this is such a small thing. Well, yeah, this is a small thing, but this is like the tipping point. We did this at that time. You did this at that time. You did this at that time. You did this at that time. And this is the last straw that broke the back of the camel. Finished. You are going to 
be fired now so just as certain situations in which certain reactions come to us they may be a sum total an accumulation of all that we have done in the past uh, in the recent relate, relevant past so similarly for us certain reactions may come at a particular time which may be not just the reaction to the immediate action but the reaction to the multiple actions before that that's how multiple causes may lead to one effect and that's how we sometimes experience that i i made a small mistake and i got such a disastrous result that's why if we just if we presume and the gita is saying don't be attached to the results what it means is don't presume that the results are solely because of your actions to the extent we presume that to the extent we are negligent of the total picture and we beat ourselves up for something which we have not done very wrong or we may blame others while we have ourselves been responsible based on what we did in the past that's why be detached from the results do your part properly but if things don't work out well recognize that as long as you are doing your part well things will work out well in future another example could be that sometimes some people say they get some like a, they get a card from uh, online card purchase they have a card for purchasing from a particular online vendor amazon or whatever so they have a 250 dollar card now when they have 250 dollar card then when they want to buy they can buy something worth 50 20 80 100 and when they buy nothing happens they are not charged anything because it's just being depleted from their bank account from their card which is there which they have so what happens is in this case suppose sometime something may somebody may have done something good and the results get get getting distributed over a period of time they may have done some so that way good can come to us over distributed and even bad can come to us distributed that's why so a person who has taken 250 dollars card they say that means you know they i put 250 dollars i got nothing back but no when you need things when you want to you will you will be able to encash it you will get things so that so that that too much fixation with cause and effect i did this why did this happen to me so why did this not happen to me that if we can be detached from it we can function in life with so much more calmness so much more clarity so much more purposefulness we can actually achieve long term things by learning to cultivate a certain healthy level of detachment so when the bhagavad gita says to be detached from results that is not that does not mean be unambitious that does not mean be uh, <clears throat> be indifferent it does not mean be irresponsible it just means focus on what is in your control what is in our control is doing what we can do that and let go of what is not in your control and in this way can each one of us can function effectively in our lives so that is uh, how we can understand why the gita asks us to be detached so that brings us to the question now what is dharma so we talk about karma then what is dharma and how does dharma fit into this the whole old discussion so now dharma is sometimes translated as duty and yes that is a valid translation but it's not necessarily a complete translation dharma just doesn't mean duty but dharma means those set of activities that enable us to be who we are meant to be to be, to act according to who we really are to harmonize ourselves with the essence of who we are meant to be so each of us has a particular psychophysical nature each of us has a particular spiritual nature at our core who we are and dharma is the set of activities that enable us to be who we are meant to be to actualize our potentials to realize our essence so each of us has different dharmas so you could roughly translate dharma as duty like a student's duty is to study but what is the what is going to happen by studying the student can become who they are meant to be they can have a bright career ahead they can grow well in their lives they can become responsible con- contributing members of society in future 
they can learn wisdom by which they can make good choices and in this way a student's duty at that time is to study so the bhagavad gita explains that our identity is multi level there is body mind <clears throat> and there is soul body mind and soul so this is like we could compare it to hardware software and user the hardware is the body the software is the mind and uh, the soul the essence of who we are consciousness is the user is uh, that now what happens is for each one of us the software and the hardware they have certain resources they have certain ability there are certain things which we can do using the hardware and the software of, of a computer we can use it for coding a computer we can use it for communicating we can use it for writing recording so many purposes and the more we learn about the computer how it functions the more we can use it effectively however to use it effectively just knowing about the computer is not enough we need to know ourselves i may know what all i can do with my computer but if i don't know what i want to do then the computer can itself be a source of great distraction a person can waste so much time on their computers doing practically nothing constructive wasting time contaminating their consciousness so similarly for each one of us when we we have a body mind machine we are souls and we have body mind machine which is like the computer system which we have so we need to understand the body mind machine to some extent so that we can use it to the fullest capacity but more importantly we need to understand ourselves okay what is it that is really important for me who am i really what is it that is the uh, that can fulfill my longing for love my longing for happiness so that, that knowledge is given in the bhagavad gita so the bhagavad gita explains that each one of us is a part of the divine each one of us is a part of god and to the extent we learn to connect lovingly with him in a mood of devotion to that extent we gain access to divine guidance from within tadami buddhi yogam tam yena mam upayanti te by which we can make good choices by which we can come closer to him by which we can ultimately attain him so for us if we learn to do our dharma that means we understand who we are in relationship with the ultimate reality uh, which the bhagavad gita describes by the name krishna so we learn to cultivate a mood of devotion a mood of service then that is the dharma of the soul the sanatan dharma what is it that we are meant to do and then we have what is called as the sva dharma so dharma is the the kind is the nature of our body and mind a psychophysical nature it is the kind of machine that i have somebody has a laptop for coding somebody has a laptop for gaming somebody has a laptop for maybe some other purposes so what are the features of this laptop what what should i use this laptop for what am i most inspired to do understand that once we understand these two things now what our eternal duty is as souls and what are and what the potential of our body and mind is so the gita talks about these two dharma there is para dharma supreme dharma that is the dharma of the soul to serve the lord and there is apara dharma which it also calls the sva dharma sva dharma is understand the nature of your body and mind we can't change it completely somebody who is a good musician force them to become an engineer they'll be miserable somebody who has a engineering brain force them to do, do to become an artist they may be miserable so and instead of forcing our will on our body and mind we try to understand okay what is this kind body mind machine that i have how best can i use it and then use it accordingly when we do that then each one of us can both make valuable contributions during our life in this world and also develop enduring connections with the lord and ultimately at the end of our lives if we are sufficiently devoted to him if our devotion has sufficiently blossomed then we will attain him and that is life's ultimate success to make worthwhile contributions in the world while we are here and to attain the ultimate destination beyond this world 
So dharma when done fully, dharma when done holistically, when understood properly and done holistically, enable us to make both this con contribution in this world and connection beyond this world. And that way our life can be successful in all its dimensions. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna.